This is the third part of today's session on vision and attention and in the following we will talk about visual attention. So what is attention when we talk about visual attention in a psychological neuroscientific context? Well attention can mean a lot of different things depending on the context and for example not paying attention at work because you're tired, maybe not paying attention when you're a goalkeeper or maybe seeking attention, or something can capture our attention, like a salient stop sign. An often used definition of attention comes from William James. He said, attention is the taking possession of the mind in clear and vivid form of one out of what seem several simultaneously possible objects or trains of thoughts. So. There are several aspects that he is highlighting here, namely there is a voluntary aspect, so we can decide what we want to attend, and also that there is a limited capacity, so we cannot attend everything at the same time that is um, presented to us. He continues, focalizations, concentration of consciousness are of its essence. It implies withdrawal from some things in order to deal effectively with others. So this refers to the focalization, um, the selection of relevant information, and also ignoring irrelevant information. So when do we need um, visual attention in everyday life? So for example, if you're navigating your um, flying car in a modern city like this, I think this is Southampton in a hundred years from now, then you will easily see that there's much more information than you can process at any given time. And this is where attention comes in handy. So attention in cognitive neuroscience refers to a selection mechanism, a filter. So we have an input, a lot of information, and we have a bottleneck, we cannot select all the information at the same time, we need to select a subset. So we need to select some information while other information is filtered out. It's ignored. So attention serves as a filter to avoid that we are overloaded with information. The first record of measuring attention comes from this paradigm used by Hermann von Helmholtz. He measured what is called covert attention. Covert attention refers to attention um, in a way that you preferentially process certain areas without moving your eyes. So in this experiment uh, participants had to covertly attend a certain location. So for example here they had to attend the upper right part of this um, of this letter table that was in front of them. They were in darkness and then only for a very short amount of time, of course they didn't have computers back then in 1860, they used some kind of electric spark that would only illuminate the room for a very brief amount of time. So participants had to focus on the center of this letter table, but they had to prepare to report letters from this area here. And that's why it's referring to covert special attention. So um, what, what the Helmholtz found was that participants did have an impression of these letters in the attended region, whereas they could not report letters from the unattended region. So just to clarify and distinguish here between overt and covert attention deployment, um, overt attention deployment is changing the physical input to the retina by moving your eyes. So for example, if you're sitting in a cockpit and then you need to read information um, from this panel here, you can move your eyes and look at that location. So you're moving your eyes, the, retina, uh, the retinal input is different. 
covert attention deployment refers to a process where the retinal input is exactly the same that is you do not move your eyes but instead you um, prioritize a part of the visual field and this can change so for example you may prioritize this part of the visual field or this part of the visual field even though the retinal input is identical. Let's test your visual attention with this task. You can do this at home now and your task would be to look at the fixation cross in the center and try to not move your eyes when there is something appearing on the screen. After a short period of time, after the countdown is over, there will be a small object presented in one of the circles, which can be a triangle or a square. And your task is to say which one it is. Okay, let's start the first trial. Okay, so what you should have seen is a triangle in this circle here. Let's try another one. This should have been a square in this circle. And another one. A square here. Another one. A triangle here. And another one. A triangle here. And one more. A square here. So what you probably noticed is that in the later trials, in addition to the small object you had to respond to, there was also a yellow flash of light. So one of the circles turned yellow for a brief moment. And this could be at the same location as the subsequently presented object, or it could have been at a different location. So um, maybe it was also your impression that if the, if the yellow flash of light was presented at the same location, it was helpful, whereas it was um, distracting you in if it was presented in a different location. And this was experimentally tested in the so-called spatial queuing paradigm by Michael Posner. So in this experiment in 1980, he um, first used the spatial queuing paradigm. So in this experiment, participants had to detect a similar object like the one you've seen. Um, there were different versions of this task. Um, Sometimes you had to say whether there was a dot or not, or where the dot was left or right, or whether there was a dot or another object. So this is the target display, and again this is the target, so they had to respond to this little dot here. Now prior to the target display there was a queue display. The queue display was kind of similar to what you've done in the demo, namely there was a flash of light either at the same location, at a different location, or, and this condition was not in the demo, at both locations. So these are called the neutral trials because they do not help or hurt you in any way. Um, they're just presenting, this is like non-spatial information given to you, um, so some kind of baseline condition. The valid trials, of course, are supposed to help you because if your attention is already captured at the location where the target is presented, then you should be better or faster. If, however, your attention is captured at the wrong location and then the target is presented here, that means that you need to disengage attention from this location and uh, redistribute it to the target location. And this is exactly what they found, so the neutral, let's take that as a baseline, and then in the valid trials we see that there's a benefit. It's a lower bar because the response time is lower, so they're faster, they're better. 
in the invalid condition, so when the light flash was at the wrong location, there's this cost, longer response times compared to the baseline. So this actually suggests that there was some kind of shift of attention towards the queued location. And then as a result, you have enhanced processing of the stimulus at that location. Interestingly, this also works if the queue is invalid most of the time. So this um, suggests it's an automatic effect. Participants are not willingly um, shifting their attention to the queue. It is something that happens automatically, because if they could willfully shift their attention, um, then they would not do that anymore if they knew that in most, most of the time um, the queue would invalidly indicate the target location. From these queuing paradigms, the metaphor of an attentional spotlight was derived. So this describes the spatial properties of attention. So attention is some kind of spotlight that moves through the visual field. And then if you present a queue in the center, for example, if you tell people where to expect the target with an arrow here, then you can shift your attention here and then the target is in the spotlight because anything in the spotlight can be processed more efficiently. This is of course just a metaphor and what it refers to neurally is that more resources are dedicated to processing anything at that location that is indicated by the queue. So the properties of attention that are highlighted here with this metaphor are that attention is a limited resource, so we can't just attend everything at the same time. Um, the border of the spotlight is what indicates how much resources, how many resources we can um, invest. Um, and the cues um, that induce the movement of the spotlight, um, that's what then can explain these um, these results. So if the spotlight is at the wrong location you have a cost because you need to reshift the spotlight. If you're already at the right location in the valid trials then you can benefit from already having the spotlight at the right location. There's also another kind of um, revised um, model of attentional spotlight the zoom lens model. So this is kind of similar to the spotlight in a way that um, attention is spatially moved around. But um, the important part here is that the shape of the attentional focus can change. So this is a trade-off between the size and the resolution of the attention. So for example, if you have a small spotlight, a small, in this case, it's, if it's a lens, a zoom lens and a small um, setting of the zoom lens would allow a higher resolution but you can also widen the zoom lens and then you would have less of a benefit but a larger area that is covered. So the spatial queuing paradigm uh, does also work with presenting central cues so instead of flashing the periphery, you can also present arrows in the center and then participants would have to attend, in this case, the right hemifield, here the left hemifield, and again this is the neutral trials in which no specific spatial information is provided to the participants. Interestingly, this however only works when the um, arrows are valid most of the time. So this suggests that here this is not automatic. This is really something that is um, willfully happening. So participants decide to shift their attention to the location. So there's different kinds of attention shifts, automatically triggered ones and um, voluntarily triggered ones. What else can induce attention deployment? gaze was suggested and this was experimentally tested by Frischen and colleagues in 2007. Here this task was to press a button when there is a dot in any of the boxes. So let's do a trial. 
So again, in terms of queuing experiments, this would be a valid trial because the person looked into the direction of where the target was then presented. So the gaze direction is the spatial queue here. And this also works if the queue is invalid most of the time, so it seems to be more automatic. Now the question is how fast do queues work? So how long does it take for attention to be shifted once you receive information about the expected location of the target? So this can be tested by varying the delay between the queue and the target, which is also called the interstimulus interval or ISI. So for example, the um, the queue could be presented here and then after a short interstimulus interval the target is presented or after a longer one um, or maybe there is some kind of a sweet spot where you exactly hit the benefit. Um, the thing is if you have a relatively long ISI it could be that this is actually too late because attention is not deployed at the queued location anymore rather it is already been redistributed. If the ISI is too short then maybe attention didn't have enough time to actually being deployed to the relevant location. So maybe there's something like a sweet spot here. This was again experimentally tested. So here we have uh, the results for peripheral exogenous cues in such a queuing experiment. So this is similar to what uh, we did with these um, light Le uh, yellow flashes in the periphery and what you see is that you have some you have the most benefit the queuing benefit so queuing benefit is how much you benefit from the queue compared to the neutral condition and the benefit is highest at around shortly before 100 milliseconds if you use central endogenous cues so these arrows for example then you see it takes longer for that benefit to evolve eventually they're almost at the same level and it doesn't decay anymore so willfully redistributed attention takes longer to evolve compared to automatic um, attention deployment but it also lasts longer and gaze cues are interestingly somewhere in the middle so they're relatively fast triggered and decay a little bit but not as much as peripheral cues. So to compare these cue types we have exogenous cues which are not affected by cue validity they are automatic and they have a relatively short latency around 50 milliseconds but are transient so um, after 200 milliseconds or so the queuing effect is gone again. Endogenous queues only work for queues with a high validity, so those that oftentimes indicate the target location correctly, uh, which suggests that they are under voluntary control and they have a longer latency, so it takes longer for attention to be deployed voluntarily. But at the same time, they're also more sustained and last at least 500 milliseconds. Gaze queues are not affected by queue validity, so a little bit um, like exogenous queues in a way that they're automatic, but they are also more sustained, so that reminds us more of the endogenous queues, and this medium latency of queuing is, so to say, somewhere in the middle between exogenous and endogenous queues. Okay, so much about the basics of visual attention and the spatial queuing paradigm. In the following, we will talk about the visual search task as one of the most important paradigms in visual attention and other related paradigms.